Shackman was not as powerful back in the 1990s. So when I was on, on the Central Committee, there still was a lot of trading of jobs and, and, and other uh, other things. Now, in Evanston, where I was the committeeman here, we, we were always the outlier because we, we we didn't ask for jobs. We asked for good government. In fact, that's what I always said. My, my legacy, I hope, will be at the county and the Forest Preserve is that we got good government out of the, of the, the 20 years. Hello. Welcome to the Cloudcast. I'm Alex Nitkin, hosting what will be my last episode today as my time at the Daily Line comes to an end. Cook County Commissioner Larry Sufferton was first elected in 2002 to represent the county board's 13th district, which which includes Chicago's Rogers Park neighborhood and its North Shore suburbs. At the time, he was an insurgent looking to shake up the county's old ways of doing things and make government more efficient and service focused. Now, 20 years later, at the age of 74, Sufferton is staring down retirement, looking back at a long career that saw him climb from a kind of gadfly on the county board into a real power position who's left a pretty serious mark on Cook County's politics and its government. I sat down with Sufferton in his Evanston office on Friday. We look back at those early years when he was a thorn in the side of County Board President John Stroger and how he was able to leverage his dissent into some really major changes for the way things are done at the county government level. We talked about the last work he's trying to finish on the board before he retires at the end of the year, including a campaign to pass a ballot referendum to raise money for the county's Forest Preserve District. And we talked about some corners of county government that still concern him, including organizational issues in state's attorney Kim Fox's office and a really unprecedented labor shortage across county government. So here is my interview with Commissioner Sufferden. Well, thank you so much for coming on on what will be my last episode of the Clubcast. I really appreciate it, Commissioner. Well, How are I'm, you? I'm honored to be your last uh, interviewee. <laughs> so one thing that I did not realize about you until I was doing a little research for this is that you very early in your career were a Cook County public defender. Absolutely. Um, that yeah. that was one of your, was that your first job in the county? Or? Well, it was my first job uh, after the Air Force, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, That's my first right. job as a licensed lawyer. So I, I'm wondering, you know, thinking about how much today sort of acrimony and debate there is about about crime, about the Cook County court system. I, I wonder how that experience sort of shapes the way that you think about the way that the court system and the justice system, system operates even today as a commissioner. Well, it, it plays a very important role. Uh, uh, I was so very fortunate that uh, when I got out of the Air Force and I got hired by the Cook County Public Defender, I was the 62nd assistant. There were only 62, so I was the last person in their budget and in uh, two and a half years, I got to try 32 juries to verdict, the majority of them being murder cases because we had a explosion of murders back then in 73, 74, and 75. Mm. And um, it really gave me an opportunity to see all parts of it, dealing with police departments, dealing with uh, the, the judges. Uh, uh, and I, you know, I think to this day, it's something that causes me to have a lot of interest and concerns. As you may remember, in 2008, I ran for state's attorney, and my whole program was based upon my experiences of interacting in the court systems and figuring out how the state's attorney's office could be used as a real tool to improve the quality of justice in the whole community and the safety of the whole community. So, yeah, the public defender's office meant a lot to me. Uh, over the years on the county board, because of that experience, it's what made sure I got involved in transferring the JTDC's leadership from uh, the president of the county board to the chief judge, as it is in all the other parts of Illinois, because I, I realized the judicial function was really the least political in many ways of, of all of the processes that are in that justice system. Mm -hmm. Is that something that appealed to you about it? That it was the least. Political. Oh, absolutely, because justice should be blind. You know, the the famous statue of justice. She's, she's blindfolded, and and uh, you know, part of the problem with state's attorneys that we've had is they've politicized the office, and or or they've let the office take control of them, mm -hmm. and then when situations that really required leadership, be it Laquan McDonald's uh, shooting or or other cases, pop up. There's not. There's no s real core strength within that office to um, accomplish what really the office should be, the leading justice office in the state, because it is the largest uh, county. There is, of course, just by circumstance today, uh, a huge political debate over the state's attorney's office. Uh, we have 
seen in the news and heard about a lot of high profile resignations, people who are frustrated with um, State's Attorney Fox's leadership office. I, I wonder how that kind of standard uh, applies to her in your mind if you're concerned about that office or if everyone, um, you know, her, her critics are, are more um, not getting something here. Well, the office has become huge. Uh, you know, as I said, I was the 62nd assistant public defender. I think there were only 200 state's attorneys at, at the time. And, you know, today I, I think the state's attorney's office is just under 1,000 lawyers. It's, it's, a, it's a huge operation. But one of the problems that I see and, and the fact that these resignations of long-term people are uh, getting so much publicity is that the office does not have um, a um, spreading out of authority and of experience. Mm-hmm. It, it is still very much five, six people are running the whole operation. And that, that's you can't do that in a county this size. And I think that that's the problem that she's running into now is that as those key people leave, the other people haven't been put in a position, haven't been trained, haven't been given the opportunity to to take the leadership role. And so she's now going to have a learning curve for some key people. And I've un- I understand that they're having some issues with having uh, asked for volunteer lawyers to try cases because they, they, their pipeline of, of trial lawyers has, mm-hmm. hasn't been continued and hasn't been enhanced. Uh, no, it, it not, uh, it's not her fault completely because the economy is so different today. I mean, we're having the same problem with nurses and we're having the same problem with the uh, correctional officers where it's hard for the county to, to keep people and, and, and to hire them. But um, uh, the, uh, the office should be setting the standard for what makes this community safe. And I, I think that unfortunately, that's not where we are today. That the office is not setting the standard because of organizational issues, because of the leadership. I, I think it, it is. Um, more uh, the organizational issues and I suppose that you have to be critical of leadership because it doesn't seem to have it's too dependent upon the five people at the top and if those five people decide to leave or three of them leave then you're you're rudderless for a period of time as the state's attorney office is now I think and I think that's that's what they're fighting at this point Mm. So going back then to a little earlier in your career, um, you have been an attorney for for decades. Yes. My understanding of part of how you got into politics, Cook County government in the first place, is you were pretty involved in this independent 49th Ward organization um, or sort of that group that included at the time, you know, David Orr, Jan Schakowsky, Joe Moore. Um, My understanding of this is still a little murky, so I wonder if you can just straighten out. I mean, how did you get involved in that group i mean how did that that group that that sort of independent group that was you know ascendant in the early 2000s how what was your association and how did that become your ticket to uh well my real association is with the democratic party of evanston Uh, okay now i've lived in evanston 45 years i've been a lawyer 50 years Mm -hmm. Uh, uh the 49th ward is our next uh jurisdiction to the south of us so uh, we did a number of things with them, but I started doing uh, after I left the public defender's office. I started doing election law. Um, you know, in 1988, when Vince Demuzio, Senator Demuzio, was the chair of the Democratic Party of Illinois, I was his general counsel. Uh, uh, I ended up, you know, uh, putting together uh, the platforms for the state party in the late 80s and early 90s. I, you know, did. Uh, how we pick delegates for national conventions. Uh, I'd been just involved in a lot of election law things, uh, represented people like Jan Schakowsky uh, when, when she'd, she'd run in for the state legislature when she ran for Congress. And so it, it, it just was an adjunct to my practice uh, that I did election law and I was close to the election people. And here in Evanston, Greg Kincheski was our committeeman, who was a very progressive guy, and he was followed by Woods Bowman. And Woods resigned to take a job at the county, and that's when I became the committeeman up here for four years. So I was the committeeman from 1990 to 1994. 
uh, and we had some interesting elections. We were the first group to endorse Carol Mosley Braun in 92. And so we toppled a sitting senator. It was, it was heady times. And then the Clinton uh, election. Uh, but uh, so that's how I got involved in politics. And by being close to, and, and being the lawyer for many of these candidates up our way, uh, in 2002, uh, we had a dispute with then the county commissioner, Cal Sutker, uh, over some uh, ways that uh, fees and other things that related to how the courts were run. And um, I remember Jan saying, well, you understand this better than anybody else. Why don't you run? And I thought, well, OK, I'll run. I went back, by the way, to talk to my wife about it, who had never been really keen that I'd be running for office. But she realized that the Forest Preserve was part of the deal because it's the only office you get elected and you get two governments that you run. And she was working out three days a week doing Tai Chi at the Botanic Garden. She said, well, if the Botanic Garden's in the district, you can run. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's been the joke in our house that I only ran because the Botanic Garden was in the district. Mm -hmm. Uh, So 2002 now, I asked Commissioner Pete Silvestri, who's also retiring um, a couple months ago when he was on this show, a a version of this question. He joined the board in, I think, 94. Um, I wonder if you can just describe the experience of that board, that county government in 2002. Just take us back to someone who, you know, that world that seems sort of very far away. Um, what, how would you describe the dynamics of that board and what was then the, you know, the Stroger administration so, uh, folks? Uh, Pete, when he was elected in 94 and Deborah Sims in 94, was the first time we'd gone to single member districts. Right. So that was the first map that had been drawn. 2002 was the second map that uh, they had drawn. And uh, I think because of the way they drew the map, five of us uh, defeated incumbents. Uh, and so that we had a, a group of five, and uh, the group of five, uh, Forrest Claypool was a, a very close ally of mine, and he and he and I did a number of, uh, of of things together. We joined Mike Quigley, who had gotten elected four years before us in 1998, uh, and uh, but then we had Liz Gorman, who was a rep- moderate Republican, who was elected with us. Joan Murphy, who was a, 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 a decent South Side Democrat, South Suburban uh, Democrat. We had Tony Pareka, who was kind of a wild card as uh, uh, part of our, our, our five. He had become a Republican by this point. Well, yeah. He was a Republican, yeah. yeah, and he was elected as a, uh, as a Republican. Um, uh, but so what happened is we, the five of us came in, and it was the largest number of changes in the, the board in, in an election cycle. And so the five of us I uh, came in with different ideas, and, and uh, we started working right away. I mean, I remember Forrest, uh, we put together a, a, a resolution of a, a no-confidence vote in the person who was the superintendent of the Forest Preserve at that point. Wow. And John That's a Stroger big move. Said, John Stroger said, what, what are you talking about, no-confidence vote? So, we, you know, we, we, we just we, we did things. I, one of the functions that I have as a suburban commissioner is – that uh, we get to appoint RTA, Metra. The Regional Transportation Authority. PACE, right. Regional Transportation Authority, Metra, the train and and PACE board members. Mm -hmm. And that had always been done by uh, Carl Hansen and a group of Republicans who never even had a public meeting. Mm -hmm. They just would sit in their office, and there were seven of us that qualified under the state statute of 50% or more of our district being suburban. Uh, But four of them, with, with the changeover, with Murphy and me winning, and all of a sudden it went from uh, being uh, seven Republicans to um, uh, four Republicans, uh, or five Republicans and two Democrats, but one of the Republicans was Liz Gorman. And we sat down and worked with Liz Gorman, and um, uh, we put together our own rules for, and, and we called it the first public meeting of this suburban caucus, which now is a regular thing for appointing people. And I, I wrote the bylaws. We, and, and Hans said, you can't call a meeting? I said, well, we, we just did, and we're having a public meeting. And, mm-hmm. and we elected uh, uh, Liz as the chair, and we put together a process for appointing people. We then went out and met with all the other appointing authorities, which were the chairman of all the co- Collar Counties, and we, we put a rotation in, the, and we got the first 
Cook County chair of Metra. Huh. Which uh, was it, who? Uh, well, it, it was Marty Oberman. Ah. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it was kind of a, a, a funny thing because Rich Daly, who had appointed Marty Oberman to mm-hmm. the uh, Metra board, he said, oh, that'll never happen. Suffered in his dreaming. He <laughs> thinks they'll agree to have somebody from Chicago or Cook County chair it. And, and it happened. So it, we, we, it, we, the, what was different is it was a sea change. John Stroger was really at the end of his time. Uh, he was not as sharp as he probably was earlier. And I kind of regret that I never worked with him when he was sharper. And, and we were in conflict a lot with him because he had these old ways and uh, he just wasn't open to change. Old ways meaning things being a little more relationship-based as opposed to policy-based. Uh, yeah, yeah, let me give you an example. The, uh, the first month I was on the board, we opened Stroger Hospital. All right, It had already been named for him before I got on the board. I'm out there for the ribbon cutting. I go back to Stroger Hospital, and it's pristine, by the way, on the river cutting in December of, of 2002. I go back a month later, and the place is filthy. The wash, public washrooms are filthy. The hallways are filthy. And I called John, and I said, John, our budget shows that we have more janitors than any other hospital in, in uh, Chicago, and yet we have a dirtier hospital. It's got your name on it. You ought to want to do something about it. And he said, well, Larry, I'll take care of that. So next meeting, he's got a contract for a friend of his to train janitors on how to clean. And I said, John, this isn't the way to do it. We still have more janitors. He said, Larry, you don't understand. He said, I've got to have more janitors because the people who need jobs who come to me aren't neurosurgeons. So they're, they're people who can be janitors. And if I, we're here to give jobs and contracts. And we're going to give a contract to this lady. She's going to train him to do better. Well, the place st- still it took a couple of years of fighting before we got the hospital to be clean. And it really didn't get clean until after we uh, uh, passed what was my ordinance on uh, changing the uh, governance of the hospital. That is a great segue because the next thing that I wanted to ask you about is the year 2008 was obviously a pretty tumultuous year for a lot of governments, especially in Cook County, aside from the fact that you were running for state's attorney, as you mentioned. It was a pretty busy year. The Cook County uh, Cook County Board of Commissioners, that was the year that uh, the board created the separate board of directors yes. for the health and hospital system and also uh, created the Office of the Independent Inspector General. Right. You were very involved in both of those pieces of legislation. You know, usually, very often, when there's some kind of big reform, especially something like an inspector general, that kind of thing is really spurred by you know, a scandal or some some great uh, um, political pressure that, that spurs them into action. And so obviously two very separate systems, but I wonder if you can talk about some of the context for what made those two new big branches of county government necessary. Well, 2008 was an important year for Illinois because Senator Barack Obama was the nominee for, for, for president. But we Illinois had moved the primary up to February for that uh, to help Senator Obama. And so I, when I ran for state's attorney, it was in a February primary. I, I had lost that primary, but I didn't lose my zeal for, for doing things. And county government was in total chaotic situation. Um, the budget um, that we were working on uh, did not have enough state's attorneys. State's attorneys hadn't gotten raises. I had raised all those issues in the campaign, so I was in the middle of trying to figure out how to get additional money and get money to the state's attorney's office. And even though when I lost, I still wanted to make sure I got that done. And w- where the battle came in was uh, over a sales tax increase that Todd Stroger wanted. Um, what I ended up doing is I became the ninth vote on the sales tax increase in exchange for them passing the hospital governance bill that I'd put together. And I did, had put that together based upon my experiences in watching how the hospital was operating. And I gave you my, the story about the janitors. Well, the, the hospital was run as a political entity. It was there. They were trading off jobs and, and other things. They just it, it wasn't good medicine, and it wasn't good for the structure, and we were bleeding money. So the sales tax was needed for the hospital, and it was needed for the, the state attorney's office. 
I said I'd vote for it if you gave me independent governance. I got that. Then Mike Quigley said to me, all right, well, if we get that, why don't we try and get an inspector general? And hmm. with Forrest Claypool and, and, and Mike, and, and the three of us basically took the, the lead on that. Forrest had put together, I, I think passed just before we did the inspector general, a, a whistleblower uh, ordinance. A, and so we, we put it together and the, the package just, uh, it, we were able to get it done. And um, I think that it, it clearly improved the whole quality of, of the county. And we've only had one inspector general since then. That's Pat Blanchard who will be leaving us in two months. And he's done, I think, an exceptional job. And we really, we, we had probably up to 2012, we had people who were indicted that were in offices under the president, things where the county board had had some control. I can't be controlled like to, somebody pled guilty today from the assessor's office. Well, I, I don't know who, what goes on in the assessor's office or the other separately elected. But um, since 2012, we've not had anyone indicted who works for these key offices under the president. And I think the inspector general plays an important role in having that be the standard. Is it a problem that here we are, it's, it's August, um, <clears throat> Blanchard steps down in October and there isn't someone in the wings or lined up yet? I mean, we saw what happened in Chicago with a long interim period between inspectors general. Um, are you concerned there could be a similar gap in Cook County? Well, uh, there was a, a resolution introduced at the last meeting last Thursday. Uh, it was sent to my committee. I'll hold a public hearing on it. Uh, I was not sponsoring it because the president wanted to make uh, Tim Tomasek, who is a friend of mine, the chair of the selection committee. He's this year the, the president of the Chicago Bar Association. And I have for 45 years been the, general, the legislative counsel of the Chicago Bar Association. So I, I didn't sponsor it, but he will lead a group of bar people just as we did uh, when uh, Blanchard. And I think they have enough time. Uh, if, if we need to, there might be a short interim, but the object is to have somebody in place uh, in the next couple of months. So there are some who say, look, the separate board of directors was clearly has worked for the health system. It's you have people who are dedicated health industry professionals overseeing it. They might say the next logical step is to do the same thing for the Forest Preserve District. Um, I know that I think the Civic Federation and some have been sort of critical of the idea that County commissioners are also commissioners of the Forest Preserve District. Why not get, you know, scientists, conservationists, um, people like that, have, make the Forest Preserve District their full-time charge? So when I ran in 2002, one of the platforms that I ran on was separating the Forest Preserve and having its own board. Even though it wouldn't give you oversight of the Botanical Garden anymore. Well, I might have run the for the Forest point. Preserve Board. Oh, okay. I mean, it, it, the object would be that we elect the Forest Preserve and let it, because it, it's set up as a separate government. I tried that and tried to talk to people and tried to get support for it. I also tried to get support for doing away with the Forest Preserve Police Department, sending it to the sheriff. And, you know, they, you, you try things a number of times and you're not, you're not successful. Then you say, okay, well, well, what's the next best thing? The next best thing was the Conservation Council. In a stealth way, and, and all of county government and Forest Preserve is really stealth government because nobody's quite sure what we do. We, we passed the Conservation Council. I was a sponsor of that program. We have an independent professional board that's now running the Forest Preserve. If you look at the last uh, four Forest Preserve meetings, we passed policies that were adopted by the Conservation Council. Mm -hmm. And under that ordinance, it requires people to have experience in certain uh, ecologies and uh, business sense and government sense. And uh, they, they meet on a monthly basis. They are uh, a remarkable group. The, the materials they put out are there. And some of the commissioners now complain to me that, well, they tie our hands. We, we can't do things we want to do, like give our land away. And, and I said, well, that was the whole purpose. So I, I've kind of uh, chuckled because I think I've gotten an independent board running the Forest Preserve, mm. and it's the Conservation Council. That it's this kind of policy arm think tank that's just generating all of the ideas. Right. It, they've taken, like Mike Quigley and I did a revision of the land policy ordinance, and, and they've 
upgraded that three or four times. They've, they've deal with diversity. They've had a committee to study the naming of all of our forest preserves. You know, a lot of them were named after political people. Fortunately, we didn't have many that were named after slaveholders or Civil War people. In fact, I think we had none that were named after Civil War people. But uh, uh, the um, uh, th this Conservation Council is, you know, something that, like, I, I don't know if you've ever been to one of their meetings, because nobody really covers them, but the substance of the, what they put together is uh, uh, really uh, amazing, and uh, the, uh, uh, they have been able to generate revenue and ideas for the Forest Preserve, and, and, of course, we have a really strong leader right now in Arnold Randall. Superintendent the, of the Forest Preserve. The, the superintendent of the Forest Preserve, and uh, you know, the one credit I give to Tony Preckwinkle is she has appointed some really exceptional leaders of, of departments, and, and uh, uh, Arnold Randall is her appointee to the Forest Preserve. But he works so well with the Conservation Council and with all of the other environmental groups, and I, I think we're at, a, at really one of the best points for the uh, – uh, forest Preserve. So speaking of the Forest Preserve District, I want to talk about this ballot referendum. You've spearheaded a campaign that's been, you've been trying for a couple of years now, and it's finally really happening this November. Cook County voters are going to see a question basically asking, would you like to raise your own property taxes a little bit um, in order to give the Forest Preserve District more money? Yes. Um, Folks might, you know, a couple minutes ago, you were just talking about how you took a no vote of no confidence in the Forest Preserve leadership. That was years ago, but, you know, maybe still there is some memory that people have of poor administration of the Forest Preserve District. Obviously, I don't need to tell you inflation. People have very high property taxes. Why take this step of asking people to pay even more in property taxes for this government that a lot of people don't even really know about? Right. Well, first of all, uh, you have to understand what is the Forest Preserve District. And as a district, it's a non-home rule unit of government. The county is a home rule unit of government, which gives it all kind of ways to bring revenue in to run it, the county programs. The Forest Preserve is stuck to getting revenues in two ways. One is from property taxes, and the other is from fees or grants that it, it, it earns. And so if you have a picnic permit you you pay a fee if you if you get a uh, rent a bicycle we get a portion of the, the 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 rental of the bicycle that's in the forest preserve so we, we are in a much tighter financial situation and we're a much smaller government if you take out the garden the Botan chicago botanic garden and the uh, brookfield zoo's budgets from the forest preserve budget and we only we give i think $12 million to the zoo and $9 million to the garden, but their budgets are, are, are much, much larger. It's about a $75 million uh, government that we run 72,000 acres of land. We have about 500 employees. So, so it, it, it is in a very difficult situation where it doesn't have the money to purchase additional lands we're, in, we're we're allowed to and as will rogers once said buy land they aren't making any more of it uh we're in a situation where we need to capture and preserve lands and and having these lands help us with stormwater they're helping us with our carbon footprint because of the trees that we have so um I have been actually pushing for six years to do a referendum, and I've always run into people who've given me the reasons we can't do it, we can't do it. Well, this time, we got people to agree we could. And, and a referendum is needed because it's not a home rule authority, exactly. so you have to ask people for permission to raise that tax. Right, and we're asking for permission to raise $43 million a year. Now, that's spread out over the entire county so that it, it really will come down for the average homeowner to be well under $10 uh, a, a year, I mean, people with bigger properties will will obviously pay more. But if we do this, we're we're going to really for the next hundred years lock in the forest preserves. Where, where I lived, not far from where we are here in Evanston today, uh, across the street is the house of Dwight Perkins, and it was Dwight Perkins who led the citizen group that created the Cook County Forest Preserve system. And the meetings were in his living room, so I often look out. Uh, at his house and think all those people who met in that room because of them we have a Cook County Forest Preserve system but they had a vision 100 years ago we have to have a vision for the next 100 years to preserve this land and, and protect this the environment and, and the only way we can do it is with a referendum so there is a citizens group that will be out 
giving information and, and promoting this referendum. And one of the things I intend to do is stay in office through the election so that I'm in a position to be able to talk to people about the referendum, because I think this will be one of the most important things we do to preserve the forest preserves. So as we've talked about, in addition to being a commissioner, you've worked as an attorney and also as as a lobbyist. Yep. Um, now, people might be a little suspicious or hear at first, oh, a, a public servant, a politician who's also a lobbyist might be a little suspicious of that or think that there's something maybe unsavory there. There is, I know that this came up a couple years ago during the rewrite of the county's ethics ordinance that you were involved with, trying to eliminate any kind of um, outside employment that gives, quote, the appearance of impropriety. Um, what do you tell folks who, who have that concern or, or why is it, how have you squared those two different roles and been like a faithful, you know, public servant? Okay. So, um, one, I, I'm a lawyer and, and the interesting thing is that every jurisdiction that passes some kind of ethics bill defines lobbyists differently. And a, a lot of the things that people say make you a lobbyist are things that are what I've always done in the practice of law. So, and as a lawyer, I'm already under a, a broader ethics standard uh, with the ARDC, the Attorney Registration Disciplinary Commission, ability to you know take my license if if in fact I I violate that standard. So I've always had a very strict standard of of what is the appearance of impropriety, and and uh, I've given up a lot of clients that I had prior to being elected. I've always limited myself to only issues that have nothing to do with county government and would not even indirectly relate uh, to to uh, county government. And, um, you know, I just say to people, look at what I've done, look at the people I've represented, look at the positions that I've taken. And um, uh, I, I think that you can, if these are not full-time jobs. I mean, one of the problems is if you want them to be full-time jobs, like the Congress is, then you should pay full-time standards. Now, but one of the last things I've done on the county side is I put together a process for there to be a pay raise. Mm -hmm. Now, it won't affect me. I'm not getting any of the pay raised. My salary was the same all 20 years that, that I was here. But I realize that there are a lot of people who think about running and then decide they can't run because it, there, this office doesn't pay that much. And all the other elected offices, many of which need to be full time, were only paying $105,000 a year with staff people making up to 180 or 90,000 a year, which is crazy that you're supervising people who are making that much more than you are. So uh, what, what I always say to people is we need to be constantly reviewing the ethics and the standards, and, and you got to make determinations. If you want full-time people for these jobs, then you're going to have to have a full-time salary for these jobs. And, um, uh, you know, I, I hope that my conduct when looked at uh, historically and by the, the people who, who count will realize that I, I tried to set a standard of not having any conflicts and not being in a position and, you know, to the detriment of myself and, and, and my family, because I, my wife says that I, I, when I see a line, I'm, I'm always going to be 50 yards behind it. I'm never going to go up to the line. And I, you know, I think that that's where we should be. Mm -hmm. You've taken a lot of hard votes over these last 20 years. You mentioned the vote to raise the sales tax in 2008, which is obviously was controversial and close. There was another similar sales tax hike in 2015 that was close, that was difficult. You and were, I didn't vote for it. Uh, and I will tell you why I didn't vote for it. It's still, there's hard feelings with some of Tony Preckwinkle's uh, 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 supporters because she ran on uh, on repealing the the original. That's right. Threat, and then we repealed it. And then she wanted to reinstitute it. And I said, I can't do that. You know, I, I voted to repeal. I listened to the people. I'm not going to now reimpose it. Um, uh, and even though that when it was reimposed, that that's for the sales tax money that goes towards the pensions, which was another one of my proposals. I, I actually put in that we should be paying more into the pensions than we're required by statute. 
Uh, and I got a state's attorney's opinion saying we could do it. Tony went out and hired an independent lawyer who gave her an opinion saying they couldn't do it. And we ended up going to Springfield and getting the law changed so that we could do it. But So uh, you could it, raise the sales tax to shore up the yeah, but I, I voted against that. But the toughest vote I, I've, I've had in the last five years is the soda pop tax. I was going to mention, yeah. yeah and, and the soda pop tax, I was totally in favor of. Uh, and... and in years ago, uh, over 20 years ago, uh, uh, I represented Pepsi at one point. So I, I understand the soda pop industry and the sugary drink industry, but I was convinced that this was a, a two for one. We needed the money because, again, the county was in a, a particularly difficult financial situation. But two, this was a health crisis, which still is a health crisis with diabetes and high blood pressure and other things that sugary drinks have an impact on. And so uh, Mayor Bloomberg at that point in New York was doing a lot of things. And I I saw this as a a great opportunity to pass this sugary drink tax. And I, you know, I had in my district a Coca-Cola bottling plant. I went out and met with all of them at their place. People were always amazed because there was no group I wouldn't meet with, no matter how adamantly they were for it or against it, to try to explain my position. Uh, and, uh, And we passed it. And then all of a sudden, commissioners caved and you know i'm respectful of everybody's position when it came down to the final vote i was the only one who was still voting for the 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 sugary tax um now jerry eisman butler had voted with me in a committee vote but then he was sick the day that we had to take the final vote but i think he would have would have been with me too uh uh but uh, you know i think it's an unfortunate thing because i think the county would have been healthier financially and healthier by the, the, the putting restrictions on and getting people to have second thoughts about sugary drinks. Uh, but, they, but that was a, a difficult thing because the soda pop industry spent millions of dollars, yeah. campaigns. I mean, I, I was getting so many um, uh, mailings in my district. I think we got 17 separate mailings. My grandkids, uh, when they, would, they had my picture on them, they had no idea what, what it said because uh, I think that the oldest may have been like five years old at that point. But, you know, the, 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 their mail would come and there'd be grandpa's photo and they, they, you know, they'd get all <laughs> excited, you know, and the next time I saw them, they'd say, we saw your photo. And I said, well, I'm glad you can't read yet. <laughs> <laughs> you, so point being, you've taken a lot of hard votes. Um, that must have been a very lonely and difficult vote to cast in 2017 uh, to keep the, the soda tax. My question is, are there any votes that you regret or is there any that stand out in your mind as I, I wish I could go back and, and do that differently? Um, no, I, I don't have any regrets for uh, any of the votes. You know, there's always emotional times, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> It, it, I was at the old hospital. One of the key things that I hope that I'll be remembered for is keeping the old county hospital up when it, when uh, John Stroger wanted it demolished. Um, and even though it's it's because of COVID, it hasn't been uh, become the the magnet that I thought it would for those hotels and offices and the food court there. Um, uh, I I I think that was a traumatic. I Bobby Steele became my ninth vote. I was because. And I remember walking in her office, she was holding her phone out as ha- far away from her ear as she could with her hand, and I could hear John Sturger yelling at her that she needed to vote with him to demolish and not vote with Suffered. And what's Suffered had ever done for you was what John was saying to her. And, and I said to her, look, Bobby, you, you're a West Sider, and there are only two buildings in the whole area that met every ethnic and racial group that came to this community. One is Hull House, and now that's preserved, Jane Addams Hull House on, on the University of Illinois campus, and we'll preserve the, this building here which, where great medicine was done. And, and, and the controversy of that was uh, all over the place, but we won. And I think my, my attitude has always been once you finish with something, there shouldn't be hard feelings. You should go forward. And I, I've, even though I've disagreed with a number of people on the board about a lot of things, I think I've always tried to get along with them. And I, uh, we've been a pretty c- uh, comprehensively con- uh, uh, agreeable group of commissioners in the time I've been there. The Cook County Democratic Party has obviously changed a lot since you were a committeeman um, in the 90s. Uh, I wonder if you could share some thoughts on 
you know, your, your view of, of chair Tony Preckwinkle's leadership of the party compared to Barrios, compared to, you know, how it was run previously and sort of what direction you feel like the party <laughs> apparatus is moving in these days. Well, uh, uh, Tom Lyons was the uh, chair of the party when I uh, was a committeeman. And, and the party was very different. Um, you know, the, we've been involved with Shackman my whole 20 years here on, on the board. Uh, Shackman was not as powerful back in the 1990s. So when I was on, on the Central Committee, there still was a lot of trading of jobs and, and, and other uh, other things. Now, Shackman, I'm sorry, I just want to pause. Shackman, the lawsuit that led to federal oversight. Uh, uh, hiring. Yeah. And, and, and that you can't use political considerations in hiring. And Evanston, where I was the committeeman here, we we were always the outlier because we 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 didn't ask for jobs. We asked for good government. In fact, that's what I always say. My my legacy, I hope, will be at the county and the forest preserve is that we got good government out of the of the the twenty years. I think Tony has done a good job in taking over um, a party structure that's going through tremendous sea changes. Uh, we don't have strong ward organizations and township organizations. They're all volunteer organizations. Well, for Evanston, that's great because that's been our model since Abner Mikva moved up here in 1972. And Evanston, you know, if you talk about the 49th Ward being a, a, a place where progressive politics was active, then Evanston was clearly the, the heart of progressive politics. We spread into New Trier. So when I was elected in 2002, I was the only Democrat representing New Trier at any level. Mm -hmm. Today, there are no Republicans representing New, New Trier. And now that's moved into Northfield Township. Um, uh, there are uh, no Republicans representing Northfield Township. And, but, and again, our political organizations are all volunteer organizations. So Tony's done a good job of trying to figure out how you centralize and get support for a slate of candidates, how to make sure that at least your judicial candidates have been found qualified by the bar associations. And and uh, so I, I don't know why she wants the job, because I think it's a thankless task, but I, I think she's done a good job as a party chair. I think she's done a good job as president. She and I have not always agreed on things and and uh we've had a, a lot of hard discussions about budgetary issues and about policy issues but when we came down to core things like the assault weapons ban uh i had passed that in 2006 uh you know last week we we did a resolution to encourage the congress and the general assembly to follow our lead and and do an assault weapons ban and uh, she's been supportive of that. The minimum wage that, that I was able to cobble together votes for and pass. She, she, it's the only bill signing she's ever done or ordinance signing with the, uh, the activist who wanted that minimum wage bill. Uh, so she, she's, she's always been supportive of progressive ideas. So I, uh, uh, I, I think that one of the reasons I can leave right now is that I feel that there's good young people and they're, they're coming up behind us and I'll be 75 in October. Uh, I couldn't see running for a term of office that took me to be 79. I know that you know Nancy Pelosi and President Biden and uh, all kind of people that are out there are, are better. I kid Tony, she's seven months older than I am. Uh, but I, I, I just felt it's, it's important that there be a next generation. And Josina Marita, who I, at this point is on a poll, well, I, I think she got a Republican opponent last week when everybody did, but I don't see a Republican winning in our district. Uh, she'll do a great job. She's shown a, a great uh, leadership and, and um, vision at uh, water reclamation, and, and, and I'm kind of looking forward to watching the, the people in their 30s and 40s put together a, and, and see change this government again. Mm -hmm. So 19 and a half years, give or take, under your belt on the county board, four months left. Obviously, passing that Forest Preserve District referendum is a big priority of yours. What else do you want to hurry up and make sure that you get done before you uh, leave? Well, I, I, I'm not going to get this uh, uh, done, but I, I, I'm going to work on trying to set up a little bit of a framework and suggestions to the county board and to the legislature to try to get a better and more cohesive public health system for Illinois. Uh, my district is the only one that had five separate 
public health departments. The city of Chicago's public health department, the city of Evanston's public health department, the village of Skokie's public health department, the Cook County health department for the rest of the suburban areas outside of Evanston and Skokie, and then the state health department. And uh, I was convening meetings of elected officials trying to figure out how to deal with PPE at the beginning of the pandemic, how to deal with uh, testing, how to deal with contact tracing, how to deal with vaccines, uh, and how to enforce masking and things like that. And watching the governor having to issue every 30 days a, a declaration, a disaster declaration, um, we need to have a better and more cohesive way to deal with uh, pandemics, especially the monkeypox fe- uh, f- epidemic is going to again test us. I mean, we're having a hearing this coming Monday, and one of the issues is the, the feds have given to the city of Chicago monkeypox vaccines, but they've only given uh, to the state to, for the rest of us, and we've only gotten from the state a handful of vaccines. And the question is, how do we better have equity in, in, in distributing that? So um, I want to work on at least making recommendations for a more unified approach where the governor of the state, and in our case, maybe the president of the county board, can enforce what's necessary to protect the public health. So th- those are the two things I think that I have left to, 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 to work on. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of happy with uh, uh, where I'm ending up. And, uh, um, you know, I'm uh, glad to be working with and, and looking forward to watching what the Scott Brittons of the world do, the Bill Lowry's of the world do, the Stan Moores, the Dennis Deers, the Donna Millers, uh, uh, the the uh, Bridget Degnans, you know, yeah, there, there, there's just a great cadre of young people that are out there, and uh, you know, I think that county government will be in in, in a good position. So I do want to finally look forward. Clearly, the the county it sounds like has made a lot of strides that you're talking about. It also faces some pretty major challenges. We talked about the court system in the beginning, and there's the hospital system, and we haven't even gotten into the tax offices, which there is a fair amount of uh, drama, I guess you could say, there now. What what keeps you up at night the most about, uh, a, you know, a plank of county government and its operation? Well, uh, the, the tax offices... Um, it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that I realized when I first got elected is to make this office relevant to my constituents, I needed to be providing some kind of a service. The service I decided to provide was real estate tax assessment appeal services. And our office has helped our individual constituents file over 10,000 appeals in the 20 years to either the assessor or the board of review. And we've held over 200 meetings long before the assessor and the board of review people would come out to do their own meetings. I did these on my own and um, kind of became a legal expert uh, on the whole assessment process. And to me, that's the cornerstone of all of our local governments because they're all dependent upon uh, property taxes, especially our schools. Uh, And so providing that service has meant a lot. I think we're getting better at transparency, but the thing that does keep me up at night is the lack of staffing that we have right now. We're spending $20 million a month, $20 million a month to buy registry nurses, lab technicians, physical therapists for the hospital system. And we've got a large number of jobs there. We've got a large number of jobs at the jail. We have got to make our, our jobs more attractive. We've got to give people an opportunity. At the last board meeting, we, we decided to have signing bonuses that were to be competitive. But in all of these things, because of uh, the, the court decrees that were under, under Shackman, it's much harder for us to do. And while our county pay is, is not insignificant, our benefits are much better than anybody's going to get. But when you're talking to a 20 four-year-old who's just finished nursing school and somebody's offering them a cash bonus to sign and we're saying but if you wait 20 years uh, we're going to give you a great pension it, you know it, it, it's not it's not competitive so that's what keeps me up is that and eventually we're going to run out of ARPA money and county care money which is what keeps the hospital going and it, it, once that's gone, then th- they'll, they'll again want, need money from this, the county to keep them afloat. And I don't know that where that's all going to come from. 
Yeah, explaining uh, a pension to a lot of people my age in comparison to something like a 401k, people tend to be very surprised at how how attractive that is. Um, All right, what are you going to do next? Well, what I intend to do is to uh, sleep a little right after I, 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 and I intend to leave right after the election. So Josina, uh, uh, presuming that she wins in November, can be sworn in early. Uh, uh, It'd probably be about three weeks early or two weeks early, depending upon when when all the things could work out. And then, you know, I will practice law. I will, uh, I do a number of things with my son, Tom. Uh, and he and I will, uh, I hope, uh, develop some other things that I haven't been able to do because of being on the county board. Cook County Commissioner Larry Sufferden, thank you so much for coming on the Cloudcast. I really appreciate your time. Alex, thank you, and thanks for all the coverage you've given the county on the Daily Line through the years. Thank you. If Josina Morita defeats Republican Andrew Border in November, she will be sworn into office about a month later and serve a four-year term before she faces voters again. She will be representing the county's newly redrawn 13th district, which stretches a little deeper into Niles and the far north side of Chicago, but no longer includes New Trier Township up north. This episode of the Cloudcast was produced and edited by me, Alex Nickton. I want to thank you so much for listening to my episodes these last year or two, and I want to remind you that I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to keep covering Chicago government and politics at the Better Government Association, so I hope you check me out there. The Daily Line will be back with another episode of the Clubcast soon.